Good evening. Welcome to the October 8th Board of Education meeting. Uh, we have six board members present. Mr. Bloom is absent tonight on a business engagement. Um, the board, for a change, has not been in closed session before this meeting. Um, so please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We do not have any student recognition tonight. Um, the first thing on our agenda, or the next thing on our agenda, I should say, is public comments. I have uh, one blue strip slip from Donna Ravello. And um, so, Donna, if you can come up, just state your, your name and your address. And um, I just want to remind everyone that it's the board's policy uh, not to comment on what's said at public uh, comment, but uh, we certainly do listen carefully. In here, press a button on here, or it just goes. Okay, Donna Ravello, 690 Hillside Avenue. I am here because I am concerned about who is watching out for the best interest of students in our district. As a past PTA president, I was asked to make something for a memory book for our teachers. I told the teachers how important their role in life was. They were not just there to teach lessons, quote unquote, but they had the ability to touch lives like no others. I believe that they are some of the most important people other than parents that can have a lasting impact on our students' futures. Never once did I stop to think about the impact that a teacher could have who may not be working to his or her full potential. Two weeks into the school year this year, I realized that that's exactly what was happening to my daughter. We worked very diligently to try to remove our student from this classroom. We were turned down by the principal and the superintendent many times with no compromise being offered. I cannot begin to convey the turmoil and confusion that this has caused my daughter and our family. So I began to do my homework, trying to be an educated customer. My questions at this point are tenure. Who or what ever made tenure to allow a teacher to have a lifetime job once they receive tenure? Tenure, along with their contract, gives them the unfortunate ability to be protected against rightful termination. Who protects the students? Perhaps the students need a union. And why do principals and superintendents protect teachers that are less than desirable? I would also like to know, and these are things that I cannot come up with the answers. Everything is private. That's the answer that I keep getting. The privacy issues, privacy issues. Do tenure teachers receive, do any tenure teachers receive unsatisfactory or needs improvement during the formal evaluation process? Are principals keeping accurate records on teachers and writing them up the moment that their actions do not align with mission and vision statements created by the district and the schools? If not, I think we may be looking at an, at an administrative problem. Do we have the correct people in these positions to hold teachers accountable? At the end of our fight, it was apparent to us that no one was acting in our daughter's best interest. So therefore, that's what we would need to do. We chose to remove her from District 205. And the irony here is, although I am a very dissatisfied customer and have chose to go elsewhere, you continue to keep my tax dollars. I have no choice in where those go. I believe that this is a sad day in the American public school system when the educational experience is compromised to protect the less than desirable. And I ask you, how would you feel if this was your student in any of these classrooms? I believe there's probably a couple in each school. And I would also just like to be clear. We have physically left, but I am not leaving quietly, and I am very dissatisfied. Next on our agenda is super... Are there any other, i sorry, are there any other public comments? I only have one blue slip of paper, but I don't want to leave anyone out. 
Okay, hearing none, then let me move on to the superintendent's communication. Dr. Mr. Purnell. Yeah, uh, this evening uh, we would like to update the board on our academic student achievement key DPIs, district performance indicators. Uh, we do this every October. This is the updated um, district performance indicator, again, as I said, for student achievement. Uh, Dr. Charles Johns and Charles Sprandell, Director of Research and Assessment, uh, will lead the discussion tonight on the data that we have received and accumulated for the board this evening. Good evening, I'm happy to be able to report some really good news with you uh, tonight and with Charles's help. Uh, a few years ago, two years ago, the school board and the administration and the cabinet came together to establish key district performance indicators jointly during uh, summer retreat and some subsequent meetings to limit the number of data points that we would regularly report to the board uh, and keep track of and to promote within the district. And so we'll be bringing forth some of those key DPIs, what we call them, uh, key district performance indicators today and then a couple that we've chosen to, to continue to report on because they add to what we think is a, a understanding of the district in more rich detail so more than just just numbers about academic performance but about other indicators that we believe contribute to a comprehensive education of, of the level of quality and complexity that we think a school district like Elmhurst should have uh, it is important to understand that the good news that we're showing tonight is the collective work of an awful lot of people. Uh, Charles and I have both had plenty of conversations about the degree that the principals have implemented the, the key district performance indicators in their goal meetings, in their meetings that they have with staff, and we've both sat through uh, what are called building data reviews, where the building principals and their key staff or their grade level teams go through the performance of their students in, in very close detail to make sure that students who need intervention are getting help and to celebrate successes. And we're really seeing great work, uh, some great collaboration and camaraderie amongst our staff as they go through the data to make sure the needs of all students, really at both ends of the spectrum, are met. So we're gonna show you the higher level data points today. And these would be the, the key DPIs that we talked about, as I had mentioned, that have been part of uh, the conversation we had two years ago. We really have four of what we classically determined to be the key performance indicators or the key DPIs. That would be the first one, which is the ACT composite, the educational planning and assessment system, which is called EPAS. That is an indicator of growth from fall of eighth grade through the high school. And I'll, I'll often use the acronym, I'm going to apologize now, of EPAS. The third one is the AT AP participation rate. And the fourth one, that's one of our key KPIs, is down second from the bottom, which is students on track for college and career readiness, which you may recall is built off of uh, the trajectory that we created that uses the blending of the uh, NWEA MAP assessment and the EPASS system. And that kind of gives us a grade three through 12 indication of if students are on path for college and career readiness. The graduation rate, new century participation, fine arts, the achievement gra gap, and typical growth are other indicators that we use to, to flush out some of the knowledge base that we have for this level of interpretation of our results. The, the first indicator I'd like to address is the ACT composite. In each of these, we'll probably dial down quite a bit. Uh, this is a very high level uh, uh, in terms of data point. It is what we're most often compared to between different districts, because uh, it's obviously a very simple score to be able to communicate. In 11-12, we had a, the second highest AC, the ACT performance of 23.9. In the 12-13 year, we had 24.7. Uh, there's the parenthetical of 24.1 that I'll, I'll go into more detail later. When the board and the cabinet met during the summer, we set the target of a 25 that we would like to reach by the 2016-2017 school year. So uh, we've certainly narrowed uh, in on that target quite a bit in the, in the past uh, two, two years. 
What I'm showing you here is, is really a, a compilation of data of, of the EPASS system with the blue line at the top being what we call the class of ACT. That is the last assessment, the last example of the ACT that our seniors take upon graduation. So we get that data point really pretty late, which is why we hold uh, this data presentation here in October. It is, we, we know that we have about 40 to 50% of our seniors will retake the ACT after the Prairie State Administration, which is given in April of their junior year. So that's the blue line that you see at the top. That's the last score that we have. Right below it is the red line, and that's the Prairie State Administration, the ACT, which is the state provided, um, it's the assessment used for No Child Left Behind. Again, it's taken junior year. And in gold is the plan assessment, which is given in the sophomore year. That would be given in the fall of the sophomore year. And the bottom line is the explore test, which is taken by eighth graders in the fall of their eighth grade year. I want to provide a, a little more clarity of what you're looking at here by shading out some of the different years. We would look at here the class of 2011. So these are students who graduated in 2011. At the top would be their, the scores upon graduation or after graduation and their, their summative ACT score. Below that would be the spring, in the red there, we would be looking at spring 2010. The yellow would be fall of 07, 08. And at the bottom, that was their eighth grade of fall of 2006. So you can look vertically and see performance over, over uh, a class's history at our high school or between our middle school and our high school. So we, we have these data points. We want to pull out a little bit and, and dive in a little deeper. ACT started to change this year how they report the ACT scores. And it's important that we, we make note of it because in essence, most of our colleagues and certainly us are reporting two scores. The top score, it used to be ACT would report all ACTs given that were not given special accommodations. So students who had extra time, their scores were not included in the total for a given school. And this was the standard, this was consistent nationwide. This year, they are now including all students who had accommodations. So students who might have had special education ser uh, services are now included in that aggregate score. And as one would expect, there is a little bit of slippage on the score. So that's why we had 24.7, and then it slips down on that dotted line is the lower score of the included kids, included students, and that's the 24.1. I think it's important to note, and, and I think a, a lot of acclaim needs to be given to the staff. When we are not comparing apples to apples, we have tied, the student, the district performance on the ACT is tied with the, di the historical highest score the district has had. But when we use an apples to apples comparison, it's the highest ACT score in Elmhurst, Elmhurst history of 24.7, which is really outstanding. We believe, or we've been told by ACT that they will continue to report accommodated scores. So we'll likely use the dotted line for a couple of years and do something like we did prior to 2007 when the state started having all students take the ACT. You'll recall from data sessions in the past where we had a dotted line. We'll do something like that to demarcate the separation of the scores or the differences in the reporting that took place this year. But that's an awfully high score, that 24.7. It really is a lot of hard work, goal setting, great leadership on the part of, of our, our academic leaders in the district. And I think we should all be very proud of that. I got ahead of myself. So our second measure that we have is value-added growth, trying to show to the community what the, what the gain is from being a part of the Elmhurst School District. So what we're going to do is show the amount of growth from that bottom line, which is the explore taken in, in the fall of the eighth grade year, and the top line, that blue class of ACT. Our goal uh, was to reach, by 2016-17, growth of seven points. Well, we reached that last year in 11-12, and then this year eclipsed that mark to 7.2 points growth, which is very hearty, robust growth. Don't miss Charles's animations. Did you all catch that? Okay. Yeah, I know the new board members are, are, you don't look forward to this evening, but Charles always embeds some sort of animation into this. So now we're looking at the value added indicators 
and we have removed those indicators for which uh, we don't have comparison points and we enlarge it a little bit and draw on some attention this is a free version of flash wasn't it Charles okay and so you can see in 2011 uh, the growth was a, a very strong six points growth between the Explorer and the ACT and that is consistently not consistently it has grown every year and in pretty considerable growth gains to grow 1.2 points in three different years is is pretty incredible our next indicator is AP participation and we have a unique scale for this in, in District 205 the, the goal at the time that we set our KPIs is we want to make sure that as many students as possible participate in the AP program because one experience gives kids the opportunity to understand the level of rigor that they should expect for a college class but they get that level of rigor while they're living at home while they're with their parents and while they're with classroom teachers that, that do care deeply about them. And so the way we set up this formula is we took the number of students who were taking, I'm sorry, the number of unique students taking an AP class and divided by the total number of students eligible to take an AP class, which would only be sophomores, juniors, and seniors. So we had 745 unique AP testers, test takers, and we had a denominator of 1,981, which gave us those percentages. We don't have a fixed target for this. And part of the reason, that, and it always draws some attention, the part of the reason for this is we're focused on, focused on students having at least one experience taking an AP, in other words, taking a college level or college level of rigor course less than some of the other indicators and we don't have companion districts that are using the same metric as us so we really are would only fumble around and come up with an arbitrary number to set a target so what we've what we've concluded on is let's keep leaving it at as continued improvement until we can't continually improve any further and as you can see we have pretty hardy growth this year uh, and it seems to have worked as a target yes mr collins Are questions allowed? Mid you're the, you're the board president. <laughs> <laughs> just, just checking. I'm being heckled to my right. Well, I would already yeah. uh, just, just note it wasn't me heckling. <laughs> I, I duly noted. <laughs> Do we have the capability? And, and I, I completely agree with with your desired measurement to have to to try to figure out if or your I should say your goal to have each kid take a each student take a an AP level class before they graduate do we have the capability to measure that I know you're using a different measurement here but but you did mention that you know if, if we can have each each student take one experience college level rigor before they graduate can we measure that do we have the capability oh, you, you see poised, poised answer uh, we, so just to make sure that I understand, so you're asking, could we have a measure where for each graduating senior class, what percentage of the students at some time during their four years took an AP class? Exactly. Um, yes, we, we have the capability to do that. Um, that's a much harder measure to come about. Uh, it would involve us tracking throughout their career and, and basically marking students that had taken some AP class okay uh, we would we would still be in the same situation that we don't have that measure for other districts to make a comparison to yeah no uh, understood I mean I frankly I think a uh, a great theoretical but probably unattainable goal is is a you know is a hundred percent but you know I, I don't think we can expect to to attain that but the closer we can get to it the, I think the better off all of our students are 
it, we're, we're at a, we really don't have the systems to do that yet. And I, I would also, as we get closer and closer, as that percentage starts to rise, I would like us, as we revisit, as we said we would, and evaluate the KPIs, is, is to maybe broaden the definition of what we're looking for here. As, as education at the post-secondary level evolves, and it is evolving incredibly rapidly, there's other opportunities for students to get college level credit while staying at home. And as it stands, we don't have a KPI that would really leverage that to our advantage. Uh, that's something we need to, as we learn more, we need to update the board on and get a conference conversation going. There's really some incredible programs by universities not too far from here that are capitalizing on students getting college level credit while living at home and they are major universities. They are major players. They are universities that our students will go to and they can start getting college credit while living at home. And that's something I think we want to tune into. I don't think we're there yet. I know we're not there yet. Uh, but it's something we want to start to factor in is how can we leverage that into this as well. So. Um, I'll go ahead and continue. Uh, can I ask you a question, though? I see you yeah. open Pandora's box here. Yeah. Well, but can you clarify what you mean by the uh, companion districts and what other companion districts are not measuring? I, I'm, I just want a little bit more clarification well, of what you're thinking. Sure. Uh, companion districts would, we would, I personally start off with unit districts and then unit districts that have approximate demographics to ours. Uh, we also have some high school districts in the area that, that we naturally, um, mostly due to geography, compare ourselves to. Typically you'll see what you have on the, on the screen now is the comparison the most districts use because it's frankly easier to get. Uh, AP provides the number of students who take a test, the exams given, and a pass rate. So we can get that comparable data. We can, uh, through the sharing that we do in CADCA systems, I don't see it as often as we do the ACT scores, uh, because AP is, is largely impacted by demographics. Uh, I think all of us have, in the back of our minds, some concern of letting the exam taking overpass the real intent. There are plenty of children who could take an AP class or two and get benefit from it, but feel driven to take additional exams that they may or not be likely to pass and, and are, are spending money needlessly, but they've been kind of caught up in the exuberance over increasing exam taking in a district. So we're, we're going along in kind of a steady, I think comfortable clip, um, mindful that we don't want kids, students feeling pressured into taking exams because it makes us as a district look good. We want them to take these exams for the right reasons. Uh, so there is that to factor. And the other issue, and, and you can see it on the screen here, is finding the right balance between pass rate and an actual test taking and test participation. And you know, we, you, you find kind of a sweet spot between are enough kids taking the test and taking the class that we're making sure that all or more students have rigorous course background and how much are you willing to sacrifice on the, on the pass rate. You'll see up until last year that there really wasn't, it was actually an inverse correlation between the number of tests taken and the pass rate. And until last year, we finally, I shouldn't say finally, we were noticing a bit of slippage in terms of the pass rate. Uh, so these are, you know, there's multiple considerations that have at play. Uh, have at play. Um, and there's some cultural differences in terms of how school districts are driven by the AP participation um, metric. So it, I think it's something to be careful about. And, and that's, we, if you'll recall, we went through lengthy conversation. I mean, we went over and over and over on, this partic on our particular metric. I show this one because this is the, this is the one you're going to be hearing in the, in, the, in the neighborhood. You know, this is number of students taking the exam and the pass rates. Uh, 80, 86.4, based on my eyes, is, is a very high pass rate. Uh, and as you can see, we had a large surge in participation. Uh, I, so. Hey, can, can I throw in one more thing? I, I just want the consensus of the board on this, that I, I don't think the administration is going to get pushback if the participation rate is increasing and the pass rate is falling. I mean, do, are, 
I, I yeah. just want to get the board's thoughts on that. I mean, I, as far as I'm personally concerned, I'm more concerned that our kid, that our students experience college level rigor before they graduate, rather than putting an emphasis on taking the test. I'm with you. I would want us to have a discussion about that because, you know, once again, you have to look at, you know, are you driving the numbers or are you driving the real intent? And I only hesitate um, just to make it on record, right? Because, but I, but I believe we've had the healthy discussions about we want the right intent. But I think it's important for the, the community, the public, the employees to know that that is our intent. It's not just to get higher numbers here to show that we're improving, but to truly look at the linkage to, is the educational opportunity and experience that the kids get is what our number one main concern is. Um, and if you recall, and that, those, are, those are important and good points, it, the, the best or the, the I, mean, I guess the best research at the time when we had this conversation, and there's new research that came out that, that we'll be taking a look at, but the best research at the time said simply taking the class, not even taking the test, but taking an AP class, increased the likelihood of graduating within five years substantially. And then if you took the test and didn't pass, or took the test and passed, that incrementally increased uh, likelihood of success at the university. So we're keep, we kept all those things in mind. There's, like I said, some new research that I think we should bring forward maybe for next summer's retreat and continue this conversation. Did I run out of time? I just heard a beep. Oh. Shannon, <laughs> yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, when we look at the number of AP students to get the percentage, 37.6, is that number of students that took an AP class or number of students that took the AP and the a test? That's the number of students who participated in the AP program. So those okay. 745 students collectively took 1,475 assessments. So they took the test, a, a test. But aren't there more students taking AP that then they don't take a test? Yeah, I don't have the actual numbers for that, but we do hear, certainly anecdotally, that there are students who are taking the class and, and for a variety of reasons. Uh, aren't taking the aren't taking the the test, and those reasons seem to be growing. You know that that some universities are becoming more selective about what they'll accept as AP. Some won't take it as electro credit anymore. The cost is 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 reaching some families. So there's a number of factors that are causing students to take the class because they want the content, the rigor to prepare them for college, but the exam really isn't uh, have the same balance that it might have had years ago. So then that ratio, that percentage would go up then. We have a higher yeah. percentage of students taking AP classes than what we're seeing here tonight. Okay. And then how do you get more kids to take an AP class? Interesting you should ask. So um, on December 4th, the high school is running what is called the AP show place. Yep. Showcase really to, to outline and clarify and promote the AP participation. Uh, I think the other thing to remember is in a community like this, as more and more students flock to taking the AP, you, you essentially get momentum going in your favor. So some of it is, is the, no, the normal climate of the, and culture of the community, but the high schools are working very hard on this as well as part of a conversation we had with the high school this morning, really working to showcase the advantages and opportunities that we have in our AP program. Just Margaret, did advertise you? advertise again this December 4th. Yeah. I just hit, um, and I know I am uh, in agreement with the goal of increasing the AP participation. Um, what I'm wondering is, as we think about increasing the goal of the AP participation, um, and I'm not even as much focused on the exam, because as you highlighted, there's a multitude of reasons why people may or may not take that exam. Um, but having exposure to the class. I'm wondering what percent of our students, and I know it's a very high percentage, but what percent of our students go on to um, go to some type of college, be it two year or four year? Um, and based off that percentage, you know, I don't think it's 100%. I know it's pretty high. Um, you know, how, how do we balance that um, career readiness piece? Um, as well as the college readiness. I agree completely. Uh, uh, you know, it's it's important for us in a comprehensive 
program to, to not forget all students, to, to not take our eyes off of uh, the 10 to the 10% or so that are not going to go to college. We're going to go to college for maybe two years to get some sort of a, a, a certificate program, which will help them have a very uh, high standard of living. Uh, the first thing, and this kind of relates more to ACT, is that we know that the ACT score is correlated to more general career readiness. And so, um, my, by and large, professionals in education at our level, or certainly at the high school level, will we'll use that ACT score as a general indicator of career readiness. And there's, there, there's a fair amount of research behind that to show that. I also think that as, as we go into the future, as I mentioned earlier, and look into alternative ways of looking at college and career readiness that we add some sort of external entities um, evaluation component or level of rigor and expectation so we can say that this is externally referenced that, that might be something we consider adding to this down the road and there's a the, the opportunities there are growing so fast it could I could take a whole night talking about it um, I'm already losing my voice. So it, it is something we should pursue this summer. I, I, I desperately think so. Just one point of, of clarification, having two children in college. I don't want us to underestimate the great value to being exposed to and experience a college level examination, which the AP exam has provided to not only my children, but other children that you, you talk to other parents and other students that are in college. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, I've um, lost track of what's next. Okay, graduation rate. Uh, in prior to the 11-12 school year, the ISBE changed the formula for how they the graduation rate, and I beg you not to ask me what the formula entails. I remembered it last year, but I can't this year. Our graduation rate at, at last year was 92.1. That was a dip. Um, and we, we kind of factored that as being a part of, of how ISBE had recon, uh, reconfigured its formula. It is bounded back up to 94.4 which is pretty close to where it had been historically. Our target is 0 .6, 0 0.6 higher to get to, 20, to 95 by 16, 17. Now, we were concerned, if you'll recall at the time, of, of being too narrow in what we were using to evaluate and regard our district. So we added a couple metrics, and the first is the new century participation metric. And this is the percentage of high school students enrolled in world language courses, math electives, and science electives. So pushing what is really necessary, we think, to be um, successful in this, this new century, or fairly new century. And so counting up all those electives in 11-12, we had 64.7. It grew nearly 5%, which was our target. So we're now at 69.6, uh, obviously closing in on that 5% target. Uh, pretty handily so and and the other indicator that we had was a fine arts participation at the elementary level we saw a unique dip in terms of percentages of students uh, this is something that has some variance to it that I thought was a little surprising we've got a large fourth grade group that is coming in the system so while we have a small class in there we not a couple small classes we now have a very large fourth grade class that's coming in so this number will likely change a little bit uh, but it did dip it, it, it we went negative on this one However, at the middle school, we went up. So our target was 5% increase, and we had a 3.3 percentage point increase. And at the high school, we went up as well. Um, you know, I, I, we have a very strong music program in the district. Uh, I think we'll see these numbers maybe not grow radically up because it is a, a solid, it is a robust program. There's not a lot of opportunity for growth. It, it, is, it has really been a strong program for quite some time. It's not something new to the district where we would see a spike of growth. Then we looked at achievement gaps, and in, by and large, our achievement gaps, not by and large, our achievement gaps are looking at where our subgroups are not performing as well 
Uh, and we looked at it with two different sets of scores. At the elementary and middle school, we're using what's called the NWEA MAP assessment. That's an assessment that we, we give three times a year, but we use the spring assessment. And we're looking at the average RIT score at a school level uh, for all the students who take the, the MAP. We, we, join those scores together and come up with an average and break it up by subgroup. And then we use the Prairie State for the high school to look for subgroup gaps. Our goal for 16-17 was to reduce by half. As you look at this chart, this is elementary reading, what you want to see is the red being lower than the blue. The blue is 11-12. It's the first year that we collected this data in this particular way. And the red was, so the blue is two years ago, the red was last year. And you can see everywhere except for ELL, in elementary reading, we had improvement, or we had a dip. It is important when I talk about all of the achievement gap data to recognize variability is very strong here. The ELL subgroup and the African American subgroup are very, very small populations in this district. So you should anticipate lots of variability. In fact, those groups are between one-fourth and one-seventh the size of the other groups. So they will have more variability than the other, four, the other three groups. However, we saw nice drops across the board, not fast enough to hit our target level, but nice drops nonetheless. Wait, you said ELL, do you mean Hispanic? No, it's English language learners, because it, it could be of all language backgrounds and all ethnic backgrounds. Hispanic is broken out separately. It, it is a federal subgroup. So ELL is smaller and bearable like the African American? Correct, correct. It is, the ELL is a quarter the size of the Hispanic, maybe a third. Yeah, in that okay. yeah, third to a quarter the size of the Hispanic group. ELL, I'm sorry, the ma elementary math gap. We saw a little bit of rise in Hispanic, and we saw a drop. Or, we saw a drop on everything else. Middle school reading, we saw slight rises in most most categories. What's important to understand, really, in all the middle school group, is that every year we're rotating out one third of the students and another third of students of the total in the average are new students to the middle school. So there isn't a whole lot of time to, to make a real impact at the middle school level. In the ELL group in particular, we had a large number of students move into our community with uh, with an impoverished educational background. And that is a fairly large group going through our middle school. And it, they were sixth graders last year. So it's going to take a while before we see their impact kind of averaged out a little bit. So populations or, or move-ins of large groups like that can have a disproportionate impact on our subgroup scores. However, this is, you know, we had some, some marks here that are not in the direction we want them to go. And middle school math showed a, a, similar, a similar pattern. And it takes us to the high school, which is a nice way to close out on the achievement gap because we saw improvement almost across the board except for special ed. Uh, when you look at special ed and you're looking at an achievement gap, you, you should expect to see some variability because there is so much difference in special ed students that there should be, we should anticipate bouncing up and down with the score levels. Okay, so our next indicator is what we call on track for college and career readiness. You'll, you'll recall that this is related to the trajectory. The trajectory is um, work that was done by Charles to connect the map data for our, our district and correlate that to EPAS growth within the district. So we have kind of a line of best fit for elementary through high school on having some level of of uh, estimation of where students should be if they are to graduate and be college and career ready. Uh, obviously, in the younger years, there's, there, you have to be less sure of that number because students grow at different rates the younger that they are. And we certainly don't want parents thinking at third grade, gee, my child's not close to being college ready. I'm going to cash in on the, the Illinois plan if it still exists. So uh, there's some caution we have in this, but we use it as a metric for two reasons. One is because it has meaning. It gives meaning on, of college and career readiness to all levels in our school. At the same time, it is 
for us to be successful on this particular metric, we have to move the middle students above that line of best fit. So it, it is not just a matter of having a couple extra 34s, 35s, and 36s on the ACT. What it really means for us to be successful, we have to take that, that distribution of students and move them over this line, which means we, have, we can't lose sight of the impact of all students for us to be successful. Our target on this is an increase by 15%. And we had a nice pattern going into last year. Uh, we didn't have math data, I'm sorry, we didn't have reading data four years ago, but you can see for the past three years, 12, 13 included, we've had nice study, not rapid enough to meet our target, but we've had nice steady growth in reading. For math, we have four years of data, uh, and we thought we had a nice trend going. We had three years going in a row of, of increased percentages of students over that line of best fit, and we had some slippage last year. So that means that that shape of that curve is kind of slid back away from uh, that line of best fit. And at the middle school, we the, the pattern of of reading is it continues to be strong. And again, maybe a little less slippage, I think, of the middle school math. And there we were seeing patterns that would have brought us to our target level. And this is at the high school where, and this is the, the interesting point where we have the, the distribution or the, the, where we had some of our middle students, their scores might have softened a little bit for that middle group of students, the scores might have softened a little bit and pulled us off the 59.2 that we had in 11-12, despite the fact that the ACT score went up and went up a lot. So um, it is it, it, one of those things you have, to, that you have to look at multiple indicators, and that's why we included the trajectory. Because if we just look at ACT scores, you can focus on a particular group of students and see change. This holds the district accountable to all students, for all students. The other, uh, it's a nice tool that NWEA gives us. Uh, at the elementary and middle school is where we use NWEA maps. They tell us, based on a student's score, how much a, a student with that score would typically grow from fall to spring. And so what we set up is a metric of the percentage of students who grew as much as typical. So if I had a score of 171 in the fall, I might be anticipated, a typical student with a 171 in the fall might be anticipated to grow six points and have a 177 in the spring. Our goal is to have 70% of our students outperform what is typical. So when we look at a chart like this, we see these 50% and we think, gee, that's, that's like a D range, right? You gotta look at it differently we would expect anything greater than a 50% score is to the good. You'd expect if it, for it to really be typical, 50% uh, of the students at that, at that score point would be better and 50% would be lower. So whenever you see a number higher than 50%, that's good news. And so you can see in reading we hit 60% and in math we hit 63.9. So through the elementaries we're seeing really strong growth. That means that in math, 63.9% of our students are outpacing what is expected. And in middle school reading, we pretty much stayed steady. And at math, we had a nice growth point. So whereas 58.7% of our students last year in math exceeded typical. Okay, now I get to turn it over to on uh, AYP results. So I gave Charles the stuff that's more difficult to explain. So um, good luck, Charles. <laughs> so Dr. Johns went through the, the internal measures that we've set up for ourselves. My, my portion tonight is looking at the external measures that the state used and, and what happened with those. Um, I think it's important to note, and that's why we put it first here, is that to some degree a lot of this has been a moving target in the last year. There have been a lot of changes that have happened specifically within um, ISAT. First of all, the, the content of ISAT is changing. Uh, two years ago the test was based on the old Illinois state standards. The test students took last spring was 30% based on the new state standards, the Common Core standards. 
next year's test will be 100% based on the Common Core standards. Um, so the test itself is changing from year to year. Uh, the other piece that's been changing is the cut scores, and we've talked to the board about that before, about the fact that they basically raise the bar. So a score that used to be designated as meeting standards no longer is given that designation. Um, so even if a student is performing at the same level, they may get a different label applied to their score results um, because it's become harder to earn a meet standards, harder to earn and exceed standards. Um, the other thing which we've known is coming is every year the AYP cut score changes. So the number of students, <clears throat> the percentage of students that have to meet or exceed in order for a school to be designated as meeting adequate yearly progress goes up each year. Uh, two years ago it was 85% needed to have that meets and exceeds designation. Last year that went up to 92.5%. The other piece that has been moving is the idea of safe harbor. Um, and without going into too much detail, safe harbor in the past in Illinois has been a alternate way for subgroups to meet AYP. Um, the idea being that if a subgroup was performing much below, say, the 92.5% that they were has been designated as the line for meeting AYP, as long as they were showing a certain amount of improvement, then they would still get a meets AYP label applied to them. Um, in the past, that's only been applied to subgroups. This year, the state, um, without really telling us, and they still have not really publicly announced this, have started applying that to the overall school performance. In the past, the overall school performance had to meet whatever the cut score was. There was no other way to be designated as meeting AYP. Um, this year, the state is allowing Safe Harbor to be applied to the overall results. Um, in spite of all those changes, we did have five of our elementary field, uh, Edison, Jackson, Jefferson, and Lincoln, uh, meet the AYP standards this year. Um, the other elementaries, the three middles and York High School, as well as the district as a whole, uh, were designated as not meeting AYP. Another piece that's new this year that we want to take a couple of minutes and just walk you through where it comes from because it's going to be, at least we've been told, it's going to be a part of the school report cards um, that will be released at the end of October, is a growth measure that the state is going to apply to schools. Um, you know, Dr. Johns described a couple of the growth measures that we look at internally. The state has devised its own growth measure that they're going to use um, from this year and, and moving forward for schools. So just to give you a sense of where that comes from and how it's calculated. What the state has done, and there's an example of the reading chart up on the screen and in your report, is they've taken the four designations that they now apply to students, academic warning, below standards, meeting standards, and exceed standards. They've taken each one of those and subdivided them into two subcategories. So reading across the top, that's the level 1A, 1B, both fall under the academic warning, 2A, 2B, or under below standards, and so on. And they've set up score ranges for each one of those designations. And the idea is they're going to take for each student two years worth of data. So for example, a third grade ISAT and a fourth grade ISAT and look at what designation they would have for each one of those. So again, looking at the chart up there, if a student scored a 140 in reading in third grade, find where that falls and that's within academic warning, but it's 1B within the academic warning. Then next year, when they take the reading ISAT as fourth graders, say that year they got a 180. Now that's going to fall in below standards, but it's going to be a part of 2A. So they've moved from 1B to 2A by this methodology. This is a little harder because the numbers are smaller, but those two points now get applied to this value table to give that student a growth score. So along the left-hand side, we could look and find where 1B is, where the student was last year. Across the top, find 2A, where they are this year, where the two meet. So for this student, it would be 125. That's the growth score for that student for that year. 
Those individual student growth scores are not gonna be reported individually for students. Um, they're not on the student's individual report cards that go home. The only way that they're used is they calculate that growth score for every single kid in the building and then average them all up and that's the building's score. Now if you look at the values within the table, you can see that you know, the idea behind this is they're rewarding certain things. One is students moving up to higher designations are, are worth more points. They're also rewarding students that are achieving at a high level and maintaining that high level. So in that lower right hand corner where students were exceeds before and they're still exceeds, those students have a higher growth store than one that was meets before and it still meets. Now, we've also included the growth scores for District 205 schools last year. Um, I, I wanna clarify a couple of things. First of all, these are growth scores that we've calculated internally by going through and finding those designations for each student last year and this year and calculating the averages. The state as of today still has not told us what the official growth scores are for our buildings. Um, and some of the methodology that they're gonna use is still pretty unclear, which students are gonna be included, aren't gonna be included. Uh, so these numbers may be slightly different when they actually come out on the report cards, um, but I expect that they'll be pretty close to this. Uh, one of the things they have released is the bottom line, the state averages of 102 for reading and 101 for math. Um, and you can see that all of our schools have scores that are higher than that. What we don't know now is we expect them to be higher, how much higher is good? We don't have any context for this. We don't know what any other school or district scores are until the state releases everybody's at the end of this month. Um, and so we don't know how good news this is or, or where it might point to areas for improvement. And I think I'm gonna turn it back over to Charles before we get to overall questions to talk about next steps and where this data leads us. The confusion that we are currently in, either between the data tables and what's going to happen with the new uh, school and district assessment system, which is called PARC, uh, really has a big impact on our future. And I think part of a conversation we need to have this summer, certainly at administrative level we're already having, is, is what are we going to use for our KPIs <clears throat> in the future? The PARC assessment, when fully implemented, which will be not uh, in 2014-15, but we fully implemented in 15-16, includes a long battery of tests given in the fall, uh, a short battery of tests given in the early spring, and a fairly lengthy battery of tests given in the late spring. The problem is both that fall and spring battery of assessments will overlap in what have been our windows for assessment for the MAP test, which as you know is, is critical to, to several of our KPIs. We've already had, uh, we've already initiated and we'll have yet this week a bigger conversation of what we want to do with the map as we currently have. It's very valuable to us. We use it. There is, there is knowledge behind those scores and, and we have a way of evaluating our progress using MAP. Uh, we're looking for ways to kind of pull back some of the assessments based on feedback we've had from the community that are there are opportunities to pull back on assessment. The problem is we're caught uh, really between um, uh, a rock and a hard place because we don't know what's really going to happen. As, as more and more uncertainty clouds uh, the park question of whether we'll see the park assessment, we don't want to let go of the assessments that we have at hand. So we need to make some big decisions about those in the future. Uh, I suspect this summer at our retreat, we may need to, to reestablish our KPIs with new data points. The problem is, is if we, as we shift to the park, we'll be using an assessment for which there is no historical knowledge. Whereas the assessments we currently have, although probably not as good as what we're hearing about the park, um, you know, the park doesn't give us any knowledge that we can act on, and our current tests are pretty good. Uh, 
The, the staff and the leadership of the district continue to work really hard in implementing the scale model. So we're, we're by and large wrapping up standards level work, curriculum work, and content work. And, and we're seeing a large body of our teacher teams working on assessments this year. Uh, part of the long range model that I shared in subcommittee earlier this year, we have a lot of assessment work going on. Uh, last spring we did a lot, we did some work, I should say last winter, on student engagement. So we'll see a lot of activities going on now where we're taking instructional activities and increasing their engagement level. Uh, the uh, your, the administration at York High School or leadership at York High School, Churchville and Fisher and District will have to use the rising star model again this year for school improvement. That is a, uh, a fairly intensive planning process. And the district last spring did a data dive for two areas of concern, which were English language learners and students who receive special education services. And those will tie into the rising star plan. So the, the leadership of the district did a, a deep data dive and did some initial planning on those two subgroups. And that will likely fold into our, well, will surely fold into the district level rising star planning for this year. Also, in conjunction with the Elmhurst Teachers Council, we've expanded or are working to expand our professional development offerings. That is an area for growth in the district and growth and improvement in the district, and we're working collaboratively on that venture. However, if I were to do a SWOT analysis, uh, the biggest thing I see on our horizon is, is trying to anticipate and speculate the implications of, of park coming down our way, and, and then trying to gauge early if we're actually going to see it, because uh, the if park does become the assessment of the state it would pretty much impact all of our key DPIs it could leave us with next to nothing left and um, would give us few metrics in order to run the district for a couple of years until we built up a historical base of knowledge so with that good news I'll open up with questions I had uh, one last question about AP participation. <laughs> I, 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 I'm sorry. I, 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 this is our one chance to talk about this, so I'm, I'm going to take my time. Um, I, I mean, this is so important. This is what we're here for, education and, and student achievement. When you mentioned about the high school doing a showcase in December, what are we doing or are we doing anything at the middle school to prep kids to take some of those rigorous classes at York? What you largely find, particularly in math, is both for our REACH students and the accelerated group of students is we're giving them a very, very enriched level of, of education that really sets them up to do well at those higher level courses at the, at the high school. Uh, I think as, as we get more and more articulation at the middle level and the high school level, and we see more and more examples virtually every couple months, where the middle school teachers have a, a deeper, richer, fuller understanding of the curricular offerings at the high school, I think we'll see more and more opportunity for maybe not just AP classes, but students taking honors classes as well, so a, a more rigorous curriculum. So for the Explore test, we saw there, it was flat for several years, and now we're seeing a nice incline. Mm -hmm. And what, so what is the, that attributed to at the Explore at that level? There is, there has been during those years where we saw a little bit of slippage in the Explore score. During that time, a lot of hard work was being done uh, in terms of curriculum alignment uh, and some commonality of curriculum across the district, alignment to standards. So I think as we become more and more standards aligned, as those teams have grown together and look at data together, have common conversations about, common conversations, have conversations about standards and about their assessments, I think we're seeing improved instruction, improved curriculum and, and it's showing up particularly in the explore test also it's important to note that the middle schools are much more aware of the impact of the explore the explore is built into some of our subsystems for placement it is part of a conversation where I heard in the class the other day where a teacher is reminding students that the explorers in their future in their near future and how important that is so it really is it's taken a more prominent role in the district but hopefully more importantly a lot of hard work has been done three, four, five, six years out where we were putting together what, what had to have been the kind of the planting the seeds for this sort of growth that we see today. 
Charles, let me ask a question along that line. Uh, anecdotally, um, when my eighth grader, who is now a junior, um, went through a preparation for, for the Explore tests, some of her middle school teachers did absolutely nothing in preparation. Others spent quite a bit of time in preparation for the Explore. Have we standardized that at all uh, across all teachers in giving them instruction as to what's expected of, of our instructional staff in terms of prepping kids to be prepared to take the Explore test? The ideal state is that we teach the standards and kids learn the standards that are assessed by the Explore. And we have standardized the standards that the teachers are teaching. So it's more important and more valuable is, is that we really not teach the test, but we teach to the standards that the test takes. And that certainly has become much more standardized. For, for instance, if you were to, to look at a commercially available ACT preparation test, kid scores go up just because they're familiar with the directions. Um, are, are we familiarizing our kids with the directions of what they're supposed to be doing in that Explore test before they get there, or are they reading the directions the day of? I would doubt that they are reading the directions the day of. Uh, our kids take quite a few assessments these days and are pretty assessment savvy. Remember that at this point now, kids starting at third grade are taking the map three times a year. Uh, our Reading Street assessments are, are taken online or are fairly standardized assessments. So I think um, in, in almost maybe not quite to a worrisome level, but I wouldn't want to push it too much further. Our kids are taking an awful lot of standardized assessments and, and are probably pretty savvy at this point on standardized assessment taking. Um, I'll ask just a few questions. I might have to come back, Jim. But yeah, you know, first off, thanks, Charles and Charles and Dave, for all this all this effort. We've talked a lot about the metrics. Um, I thank you for answering a lot of my questions that I posed to you earlier um, about it, it's not just about the numbers, it's not just about the metrics, it's about how we're driving intentional improvement in education for our students and value to our tax dollars. Um, so thank you for all of that. And thanks for linking, you know, the great efforts that you're doing in curriculum instruction with scale and, you know, all the things that you all are working on. Um, linking it to professional development, linking it to all of the improvement efforts, continuous improvement efforts, whether it be district planning, uh, the rising stars with AYP, you know, the Harris Poll. I mean, there's all kinds of things going on and it's important for people to understand that those are all linked. Um, and it's helping us identify, you know, where do we need to invest, et cetera, okay? So everybody needs to understand the bigger picture too and that that's what we're talking about and you're doing a great job of that so i really want to thank you um the additional thick package that we got was excellent um, backup material for us too um so we've come a long way since we started talking about dpi so that that's first the second piece is as i think about our last meeting and um two conversations or two parts of our last board meeting. One is recognition of our students, and the other was our conversations and prep for this meeting about segmentation. Something that I've been thinking about maybe um, that none of us thought about before, or, or maybe this is really what we're looking for is, I know that the national and state are, are segmenting our population um, based on what you saw today, okay? But is there, com I mean, you saw the recognition that we had last week. It was from every one of those population groups, right? So we're kind of looking at it holistically, right? Maybe what we're looking at is, um, what are the commonalities in those subgroups? I mean, I actually probably think that the things that you're putting together with scale and curriculum and instruction is helping all of those subgroups. You see what I'm saying? So maybe we're slicing it wrong so there's there's something there's a struggle that they have what is that root cause and what we can implement will help every student even those you know the subgroups it's so it's not it's not you know necessarily looking at it from the labels that we're told we have to look at and report out 
Does that help you? Y yes, quite a bit. I think it's important to understand that, that what we showed you today is really cascades out into the buildings and, and, and the, the principals and the building leaderships are having uh, conversations that are related to this data, but much closer to the student level, certainly at the school level, and are, are deciding what interventions are needed for different groups, often irrespective of subgroup. But here is a student who's not learning to the degree that we want her to, to learn, what can we do to provide intervention, support, guidance to help this student's achievement go up. So this is really high level um, reporting of results, but every building, that's why I mentioned the building data reviews, that, that's really incredible work. Uh, principals and their, and often their school psychologists or some of their lead teachers are putting in hours and hours of work preparing to lead their teacher teams through an analysis of, of what students do we, uh, what students are we needing to do some extra work with or who's on the bubble of not performing as well as they could be or who, which students do we need to put some intensive work behind to help them be, be successful. It is, it is really remarkable work that they're doing. Um, and that's where, in a, in a presentation like this, sometimes we lose sight of that kind of work, that there is a lot of building level, uh, grade level team, academic team, work that's going on out there that is that is really dialed in on those groups. And sometimes, like I said, cuts past the subgroup designation, that there are learning issues that transcend groups of students and figure out ways that we can be successful with them. If I could just add to that, I think it always cuts through the subgroups at the building level. I don't think they spend a lot of time looking at subgroup data. I think they look at individual students, and they have, it's a PLC model in, in almost in all of our schools, as a matter of fact. And when you sit in on the data dives at the building level with the PLC building leadership team, they are dissecting by individual student, not by necessarily subgroup. Now, you're seeing the data on the subgroup level because, you know, federal government and other groups want to see it that way. But at the building level, we don't expect that. We expect them to be desegregating the data according to what's working and not working for students. And then, as Charles said, doing that intervention. And and the principals have done a lot of good work in the last two years of putting that culture into place. This year, for example, they made sure that they had common um, prep times, especially at the elementary level, for their grade level. So they could actually have time to sit down and do some of that data and discussion that they didn't have last year. So I think you're seeing an increase in that kind of culture of looking at the data, looking at the, the, the district DPIs, but then translating that down into what does it mean for John Smith in in Mrs. Clark's room and, and what can we do to intervene that. You don't see that necessarily at the board level and I'm not sure you know that gets really into the details of what we're doing but it is something that we continue to talk with principals about and continue to work with the principals when we meet with them about what's going on with that data and how are we doing that and as Charles said it's two specific groups last year we spent a lot of time on discussing which was ELL and special education those two that discussion is going to continue because you know you know, uh, overall, there's an indication that we're not being as effective as we should for that subgroup. How does it translate at the building level? What are we doing across the building to be effective? So, But that's the great public relations message, and that's really what we talk about. So I think that it's important, I mean, not to get into the details, but maybe just the process or the threads or, you know, that, that holistic view would be valuable for everyone. John? I want to thank you for this information. These are, this each year is, I think, the best night as a board member. Um, I think, on the whole, the taxpayers and the families of District 205 should be very pleased, um, but never satisfied because it's a culture of constant and imp continuous improvement, rather. Um, uh, but I think the news is very good. There are still things to work on, the gaps, so forth. Um, what our resident uh, data wonk, now absent tonight, is not around. It always keeps drilling down with things like decils and other 70s terms. Um, but the, uh, well, he's not around to hear this, is he? Uh, I'm sure he'll watch the tape. Oh, yeah. At any rate, um, I think what he's trying to get to, and I think you're kind of, we talked about this before, uh, about knowing that every kid is lifted up as Dave 
very accurately uh, summarized. It's a process within the buildings, within the PLC and the RTI uh, models. Um, I think he's looking for statistical evidence. I think that uh, on target trajectory for college career readiness is an excellent indicator for that, and typical growth uh, is also another one. But it doesn't, you know, it still has some aggregation going on that probably he wants to dig in. I don't know. If there is more disaggregation that can be done, whatever it is, it should be you guys that tell us what you think the net best way to tell the story is. But do, do you think there's some room for some more uh, disaggregation to show it? I mean, the the I don't know if it's the mission or vision statement is about every child, but it, it would kind of lead in that direction. Yeah, there's some tools at our disposal that we can that we can bring in the future, whether it be a, a standalone meeting or. Yeah. Uh, whether or not we decide to incorporate it into next year's meeting. NWEA MAPS gives us score bands, 10-point score bands that we can track. Uh, we have uh, pulled out some recent data on that that is very positive, mm -hmm. where we can see they're certainly not deciles, but they're score, score bands that are some, probably somewhat arbitrarily set. But the beauty is that they're meaningful to classroom teachers, so you mm -hmm. can see groups of students' performance levels and mm -hmm. be guided by the, the group NWEA, gives some guidance on how how to improve them instructionally, and at, at the EPAS level, there are score for the high school level. There are score bands that can be tracked as well. The the important thing to realize is is that we're now headed into an area where uh, the tools at our disposal limit how far and how frequently we can go in that direction. Uh, Charles is working off of a massive Excel spreadsheet, and it, you know when you you've got probably six seven years worth of data in one spreadsheet, it, it starts become an onerous task. But those are indicators that we should or could pull out into the future uh, for future conversations to do that finer grain. Mm -hmm. The point I, I think is very important to make, particularly off of the trajectory data, is, is that line of best fit has with it um, information or indicators of where students would be at a tier to intervention where they need group level additional help or those students who are at what we call tier three, think of it as a medical mm -hmm. model, who need much more acute or much more intensive support, that's built into the trajectory. And we don't track that at a, at a district level, but those are operational pieces of information that the buildings use. So while it's not shown in a presentation like this, those are action points at the <coughs> building. And, and, uh, Certainly in the buildings I was part of the, the building data reviews last year, those are regular components of the conversation. These kids are in this band on that trajectory. They either need intervention or we need to monitor them or they need something more intensive to make sure. And I think the point was very important. We don't want people falling off the table. Mm -hmm. They're not. It's at the building level where the systems are, are put in place to, to take action mm -hmm. using that knowledge closest to the children. Again, thanks to all the teachers, Dave, and all the staff. I think it's excellent results. Yeah, just to follow up a little bit, because we're talking about limited resources here. So the more that that we dig down, uh, you're trading off someplace else in the system because you're looking at the assessment department right here. Uh, what Charles has done, just so you know, we have, Charles and Charles has put Charles, <laughs> Mr. Assessment, at the building level to do some of that work. We have not diverted him to district-wide analysis of stratified subgroups and everything else. He has done that working with staff at the building level. So I want him to continue with the curriculum department to do that because that is their data that they need at a building level. So if the board wants more details than that, then we need to talk about that and what the trade-off is because I want to make sure that the, you know we're getting the data to the buildings first. Then, if the board has a need for other data, we can look at that and get other ways to do that. But just so you know, the dynamic right now, we try to we try to free up Charles, and he doesn't have a lot of time. But Charles is available for principals and staff, and he's meeting with them all the time. So he's going through their data, he's interpreting what their data is saying at the building level, and then they're taking that back and having those, you know, benchmarking decision making uh, on an individual student by grade level experience so that's just so you understand what the dynamic is going on I, I think that's a real appropriate prioritization I think so. I'd also like to add that if there is 
something the administration needs to make Charles more efficient so he can be more effective with the building administrators, please bring that to the board. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks for all this too. It's really good. Uh, I, I had two, oh, were you going, oh. Oh, you got okay. uh, I had two comments. One was if going forward when you're talking about, you know, sorry, next Don't summer. Fine. When we're talking about uh, key DPIs and you know retreat, it would be good when we look at some of these key performance indicators if we know like the why of what or what is it attributed to the, the you know the high score of the ACT and you don't have to not for tonight it just right. for the future the, the um, you know the explore going up you know the why's behind it and the growth you know that at the elementary level for math and I think it was math you know when you're seeing those inclines like what was it attributed to and not just at that building but going back because we're a unit district you know what was being being done at elementary and middle to get some of those results at the high school so maybe some of that background information of the the key points and then the other thing margaret you brought this up with uh looking at kids that go to college we we've looked at data from the national clearinghouse mm -hmm. and i looked at that this week and there's a piece of data that says how many of our kids have graduated college within six years. And but when you, what we have right now is those kids started York in 2005, mm -hmm. and the data's in 2011. So it's getting pretty old. And so maybe that's something for next summer. Is is that the company that you want to look into for getting some of those college pieces of data? And it doesn't matter whether we're doing map or park, that could be a constant looking at those pieces of data. Yeah, I'm embarrassed to say you're more on the ball with that because I didn't know we had it in yet. So the National Clearinghouse is a really this great, the old oh, the old one. Okay, so we're, I think we're still waiting. I haven't checked in the pet recently. Uh, the National Clearinghouse gives us really good data on the success rate of our students at colleges and universities. Not complete, there are some, some flaws in it, uh, but it does give us a nice ballpark picture. It should be something that is brought to a, a bigger conversation. I think last year when we brought it to the subcommittee, it was pretty enlightening. It, it was a lot of good information. Gave you would give you things to be able to communicate with uh, when you're out in the public. It, it's great stuff, and and we continue to be uh, we continue to subscribe to it at the high school level. Margaret, okay. Uh, I just want to echo my thanks, um, and then as we go around, I was trying to figure out where are my comments and trying to group them. And so I think if I was trying to group my comments around themes, it's, you know, how do we make sure we're including all students? How do we make sure that we are focusing on continuous improvement? And another key piece is how can we make sure that what we're doing, we can sustain? So I think that gets to points such as, you know, given limited resources, be they actually people and or finances, um, you know, what can we put in place that we can sustain? Because it's, it's, it's disruptive if we have something one year and then we can't repeat that the same year. Uh, the other piece that comes to mind is when I was looking, at, and this is under sustainability, when I was looking at um, some of the fluctuations year by year, I don't know, and I think you hit on that, um, what change is actually significant? Uh, you talk about subgroups and, you know, variability of the subgroup, that could have a big piece. And even when we're looking at the entire population, I don't know if a 0.2% change is something that is good or bad or even, you know, relevant or significant, I guess is a better word. Mm -hmm. um, so trying to understand, you know, what, what percentage of change is really significant. Um, and then I think I had one more point. My third point on here was um, the idea of, and I know we've talked about this, the idea of any program we put in place, trying to understand, you know, if it is for a targeted population, trying to understand how this, this program for this targeted population could apply across the board. Um, you know, so, you know, we have to focus on a, a group, a pilot group or a, a subgroup, but how can we apply that lessons learned 
um, across the table. And I think that way we can make sure that everyone is engaged and follow that idea of making sure we're looking at continual um, or all students. My last piece, I promise. This ISBE um, growth measure, I am intrigued on this because I think that could give us, I mean, it seems like it looks at every student, every student and their increase. And, you know, I'm not sure exactly how difficult it is um, or the context of, of, you know, is 102 good, is 108 good? You know, I know that's still missing, but I think that might be um, a tool for us to say, this is how we're going to look at all students without doing additional data, data dives in detail. Um, so thank you. It, it, although it's, it's confusing, I, I actually look forward to this value of table the data table that they're using, there is a sweet spot in there. Whereas if you take the students who are a little lower performing and you're able to move them, the points, I, I hate this mentality, but the points that are garnered from increasing their achievement levels are, are quite substantial. So it, it will cause districts to look at all students, I, I contend we do, and I contend that our buildings do a really good job of this, but it will make sure maybe throughout the state that we look at the, the growth of all students in ways that probably hasn't been done as thoroughly as a state uh, as it could be. I, I think at Elmhurst historically has done a, a very good job of, of looking for ways, looking out for all students. I think this bill institutionalizes it as an entire state. It's not as easy to explain to people as would be helpful. I mean, this is not something that uh, we're, we were planning on making a video podcast on this to try to get the communication out, um, putting up multiple ways of distributing this information to try to, to get it to sink in for people. Uh, but I do think that as a state, it has some power. We, we don't know all the research behind and how the state came to it. That's kind of behind a, a sh it's a shrouded in mystery at this point. But uh, we'll dig into it when it becomes available. You look like you're packing up. I got a couple of things. Oh, no. <laughs> um, first of all, I just want to echo a comment that that uh, Shannon and Margaret had said about uh, the idea of attribution. Um, I think in the future, I, you know, I'd very much like to challenge our administration to be able to apply attribution to our success. Uh, otherwise. I'd ra well, let's just put it this way. I'd rather be deliberate about what we do and be able to attribute success to our deliberate actions. So uh, there'll be more quizzing in the future about attribution. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, and, and, I, and I am focused that we're not quite on plan to meet our 2016-17 goals. Um, and we talked about about increasing the rigor through AP classes at the high school. And I, and I just put those two ideas together, that we're not on plan, and we're talking about increasing rigor at the high school. What are we doing to increase the rigor in our middle schools, in our elementary schools, uh, I guess is, is my first question. Um, and then my second line of questioning is, um, you know, I, we had to have this discussion maybe in a committee meeting that, that we spend a considerable amount of time and resources uh, kind of digging a moat around our, our REACH program and uh, defending who's in it and who's not. Um, I, I'm interested in your opinion and then in the future your assessment of what it would cost, if anything, to expand that REACH program in that we would put more kids in that more rigorous curriculum each year to better prepare them for a more rigorous curriculum once they make it to high school, which, you know, from reading some research and just applying the common sense rule seems would increase Explore scores as well. Um, and I certainly don't want kids to come home crying because they're over-challenged. But 
I think if each teacher took their very best student each year and put them in the REACH program and we expanded REACH by some modest percentage, three, I mean, if each teacher took their, their best kid, that's expanding at somewhere a rate of three to five percent a year and exposing three to five percent more kids per year to a more rigorous curriculum seems like that might get us more on track to meet our 2016-17 goals. i just curious as to your opinion. Those are interesting ideas. I, first of all, coming next month, we've been working on, uh, particularly in math, where the, the students' performance in math through the system, through elementary and middle schools, has essentially necessitated a curriculum change at eighth grade for eighth, well, has, has necessitated increased rigor instruction in math throughout the middle schools. It, it, it proceeded in elementary as well. And uh, pretty interestingly, will cause us to have students long launching into, into the high school having had a higher degree of rigor math. Uh, I think we have a strong REACH program. As, as the size of it grows, we, we're kind of losing some of what the community has intent for in terms of a REACH program. We're now serving a very broad group of students, and we don't quite have the same degree of specialized services for those very, very high, uniquely qual uh, uniquely uh, achieving students at the very high level and what I would like to see us do is take that level of rigor that you're speaking of and actually move it into the regular performing performance levels so that all students have the ability to, to have a more rigorous curriculum. To make that move has, has required us to do the real systemic steps that have been going on for the past couple of years. But first, we have to identify the curriculum, we have to identify the standards, put in place the curriculum, develop assessments, and then look for ways that we can get increased levels of achievement off of that essentially the baseline system. And we're getting that feedback now where we're getting teachers who are coming together. It's, it's happening tomorrow, right? Where the teams, or next week, tomorrow, teams are coming together to um, look at, in some departments, their performance to say, where do we have room where we can increase the, the rigor of courses? It is tomorrow. And um, that's already taken place. And we've seen it in some of our lead uh, professional learning teams so that everyone has access to a very rigorous curriculum. So I'm not sure, we're already doing work for REACH and, and for the accelerated students. I think now we need to start moving that in for the entire body of students at, at a regular level. And we've put the, the initial pieces are already in place to start to do that assessment. You, you speak of math at the, at the middle school, and I, mean, I have heard all sorts of anecdotes that uh, kids that, that take our entrance test for honors math once they, they hit high school um, that come from the REACH program, they qualify, they do well. It's the kids that come from that middle level of math that, that qualify because they pass our test for the, for the, the highest level, or, or the, I should say the second highest of, of honors math at the high school. Um, and then I, I understand a high percentage of those kids struggle. So, you know, my thought is the more kids we can move up to a higher level, the, the better off they are once they get to the high school level and the better prepared they are to achieve in these advanced placement courses that, that we're emphasizing. Um, and I, I guess my question is, what while we're evaluating all this curriculum, I mean, what is the fastest way that we can expose more kids to a more rigorous curriculum? And, and I also understand that, yes, I mean, you know, a, a truly gifted program, you know, by standards is supposed to address three to five percent of the population. Our REACH program currently addresses, you know, depending upon what level, you know, up to 20 or 25 percent of the population. And I, I say we just accept that. Um, and if we want to talk about having a truly gifted program, I'm all for it. And then let's take that what are, is our current REACH program and, and see how many can, kids can handle that level of rigor at the elementary and, and middle school levels. Uh, it, to me, the common sense test says that gets us on plan fastest, least uh, resistance and the least amount of effort um, 
that just it'll just get us there quicker than than anything else we can do I think we need to do pretty much a, a full evaluation. I, th I think if, if uh, this is a departure from where we're currently at and would take probably quite a bit of stakeholder support and in involvement in, in terms of getting the, the most students into more rigor program, that happens with the main body of students. So that looking for ways to take um, the classrooms, the, the regular classrooms, add differentiation, help those support those teachers, use some of the differentiation tools that we, we already have at our disposal, but incorporate them more fully, more expansively within a regular classroom. Really, that's where we'll be getting 80% of our students to have a more rigorous program. How, how quick, what is the implementation timeline for something like that? That's, that's kind of stuff that's going on on a regular basis. So as we're working with staff, talking and teaching them implementation, reviewing with them the curriculum that we have at our disposal, that's really stuff that goes on on, on a regular basis. That's also stuff that is also work that comes through the, the evaluation processes. So as, as administrators are evaluating teachers, one of the components we're looking at is how are, are teachers being responsive to the different needs of students in a particular classroom and adapting or differentiating content for for them so in reality it's it's ongoing now and and has been uh, probably a, even a couple of years ago been part of of the program um, actually more than a couple of years ago when when teachers were getting support both in training and materials and, and doing differentiation within the classroom so that we can try to to find kids with without setting up a separate program or an ancillary program really trying to serve all as many kids as possible um, out of uh, efficiency and cost effectiveness within that main body of students. Um, to your attribution piece, that was the first question that I posed to Charles in email, so I completely agree. We, we need, and that's the whole PR piece, you know, people understanding, and I think it helps us identify what is important to communicate to people. Um, not just the numbers, but you know how we're getting those numbers, the why is the what's we're doing. You know that's how you showcase what you're doing, right? Um, so the attribution has a lot of value. Um, it helps us identify best practices, and that's what I liked about the thick document. I mean, you could kind of start to see over time the trends if there's consistency. You know where you can uncover some expertise, best practices, you know that sort of thing. Um, around the significance of change in the numbers, I think that gets to my, e uh, my email question about uh, comparables or companion districts. Um, I know that these numbers are national numbers and it's great to have a baseline, um, you know, but I know that we, when we originally talked about these numbers, um, you know, we wanted to know how do we compare to comparable districts. Um, as well as national numbers, because the larger the population, the more diluted, and what's the significance of the numbers and the change. Um, so I think that it's just at some point, you know, we knew that we had to say, okay, what can we get done? You've done a wonderful job, so don't take it the wrong way. But, you know, how do we put a little bit more meaning behind how we're doing? Hey. I, I would love to do root cause analysis for positive things. Um, the, the problem is is that that's resource intensive, and and often uh, the variables that we would measure uh, are either not very strong or don't show a lot of separation. So a lot of times we're going to find that while we might have a hint of growth, we we certainly it won't be significant because there wasn't enough change or our population or sample size, the sample size wasn't great enough to see a change. So we'll be able to give hints, this may have had an impact, but it could have been uh, the testing conditions on a particular day. In terms of our comparables, uh, our comparable districts, it's a little more difficult because we use some metrics that they don't use. For example, there are some districts that don't use NWEA map. What further complicates it is really aside from the class of ACT data, and in most cases the Prairie State ACT data, or ISAT data, we don't see other districts' data. The, our only way of getting it would be to harvest those district websites for their nights that are the equivalent to this. And then we would 
pour through these documents and look for data points and hope that they match up. There isn't a, a common clearinghouse for these data points as of yet. And so that, that really complicates things. And what we're hoping to do this year, and this was a directive that I gave to Charles last year, is, is to make sure that we're giving more and more service at a building level. Uh, as we've said, our, our principals are working really, really hard and, and heard over and over again of principals spending between 12 and 17 hours preparing for a building data review. And we're trying to find ways that Charles can support that and cut back some of that time. And so it really, as David mentioned, at a, at a point where we need to make the decision of, do we want to, to try to do some root cause analysis on some things that are not uh, really clear in terms of outcome, or do we want to help the building principals lead their buildings and, and with stuff that, that they find immediately valuable, that they can take action on. Uh, you know, we've, we're working on a Chromebook uh, deployment at the middle school level. And we believe there's some great instructional opportunity there. And we think it's important for our students to, uh, to learn from digital media and to use digital resources for their reading. We may never find an impact in the near future, but they may go on to college or deep in their futures where they may only get content digitally, uh, but it, we didn't see the impact during our time. And so, there's some pretty, it, we're, we're looking to do some, some growth indicators where we know in our gut it's the right thing to do. We know it's preparing them for the future. We haven't figured out a way to measure it and, and don't have the tools. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I think for us to, to do some of this measurement, um, Charles would need to have a, a team of, of people who go out in the field and take calculations. You know, how many, for example, we have uh, uh, intervention centers at several, uh, well, at the middle schools, you know, really taking account of how many students spent time in the intervention center, what did they do, how long were they there, what was their growth scores. We don't have a, a meaningful way of collecting some of that data that, that we, in our heart, believe is working. Or on an individual student level, we can say, oh yeah, Johnny was at this intervention center a lot this year and it worked. To pull all that data and to put into an instrument that would aggregate it all together uh, is, is simply not a point that we're at, both in terms of personnel, resources, and technological. So as we do the Chromebooks at the middle school, is there ability to offload some of that manual work with the NWEA map on that Chromebook to upload? You know, they're taking the tests, all that information gets sent in, and it's not so manually intensive, and that helps. Is, so is there value from, can we link a one-to-one, -one, you know, with offloading and syst uh, putting a system? Uh, Yes, it's not Charles, though, it's David. And so it's, um, and I'm sure David would appreciate the help. He's not disagreeing. Um, so it, it is that his team is, is less, um, is, would spend less time setting up for these assessment systems of, of establishing testing centers, testing testing centers. Uh, that would be probably less onerous and we can control it more through the Chromebook extrapolating and pulling the data that's already an online assessment, pulling that data and, and trying to drill down to specific initiatives still is going to fall on Charles's shoulders. So That's not system, that's not a report that... It already is. It, it's, it's when you want to drill down into smaller and smaller details. If we want to know, if we want to say at, the, at uh, Bryan Middle School we have a math intervention center, uh, how do we know it's working? Well, we got a lot of variables that we have to measure to, to make that, that determination. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item on the agenda is uh, just a continued discussion on residency uh, from the last board meeting we have. So I want to do some follow-up work and just have some kind of discussion with the board about where we're headed with uh, residency. Let me go back a little bit. Uh, last spring I was uh, directed by the board to be much more aggressive in our investigation of residency issues across the district. And so we have spent a lot of man hours and resources in doing that this fall from this summer to this fall. Um, 
and I, I, I think there's some implications to that that the board needs to be aware of and to make sure that I think the board and the administration is on the same page as we move forward uh, with uh, a plan that makes it much more aggressive and much more investigative into residency throughout the district than we ever have before. So let me start with the discussion on policy. There was an issue raised at the last board meeting about whether we had the adequate policy in place in order to do the kind of investigation that we had started. So I had called legal after our board meeting and uh, had a discussion with our legal team about what our policy presently says, uh, if there were recommended changes or at least changes that could clarify what the policy is. First of all, on, on the first issue that was raised was whether or not we have the ability to compel uh, people after they establish residency to reestablish proof that they are still residents of the district. And the, um, the, the uh, answer from the legal team was yes, you do. In your policy, you have the ability to go back anytime you want and ask individual uh, parents, residents, to prove their residency to Elmhurst Public Schools. So we inherently have that ability. We don't have to change anything in our policy. We are solid there. The second issue that did come up, though, was are we clear as to what that process is to move forward if we believe a, a, a particular person has not have uh, has not established residency to our level of satisfaction so what i've asked legal to do is go back and and put that in more detail in the policies so that we are aligned and the board understands what that process looks like so that as we move forward and we have residents who cannot or will not provide the kind of proof that we are requiring for residency, there is a process and ultimately it ends up in a hearing. Uh, and we need to do our normal investigation at that point. We need to have a hearing with a hearing officer and ultimately that hearing goes to the Board of Education. I'm bringing that out because as we become more aggressive with these residency investigations, you are going to see more hearings coming to the board, and that's a cost. Uh, we have to hire a hearing officer to do each individual hearing. Uh, it would certainly go to closed sessions with the Board of Education. Uh, they would have a right to appeal. They would have a right to legal. Uh, and so just so the board knows, as we go down here, you may see an increase, at least temporarily, in the number of, of issues that comes forward through a, a formal hearing as we go through this. Uh, it, by necessity, not by necessity, I think by definition though, there was some issues raised about uh, are we targeting uh, people who have leases who are renters versus those who don't. Um, it, by the nature of the way the leases run, we have to, by obligation, ask for renewal of lease. When we have a purchase agreement, we have a purchase agreement. There is no renewal clause or renewal process in that. But for, for leases, there is. There are one-year leases normally, and there is, uh, and I believe the board wanted me to investigate the, the object and the, the proof of a renewal of a lease if a person has established. Uh, so we have begun to do that. We have pulled pulled data and we are starting to investigate and see how many non-renewals we have in the district. We are asking for those individuals to give us the kind of information we need to to see that those leases are still in effect or have been renewed. Uh, it gets to be very complicated and I want the board, uh, I just wanted to briefly review the, with the board some of the steps we have to go through because I think it's much more complicated than I think you would think it would be and, and it goes to the man hours and the time that we have. So that's why it's important the board understand this and support where we're going. Uh, there are lots of legal issues when we get into residency. We have issues of divorce. We have custody issues. We have properties and trust uh, as opposed to outright ownership. In all of those cases, we have to investigate every one of those to establish uh, is a divorce, who has custody, if the propriety is in trust, who's the name in the trust. So it takes man hours to do that. We actually sometimes sit down and draw family trees to try to connect all the people residing in an address because, again, we have to prove that the person is really there and there's a claim and somebody is claiming that they actually reside there. Uh, 
we have a number of landlords that don't provide leases for us. We have to call those landlords and follow up and try to get a lease renewal. Sometimes the landlords don't do that, refuse to do that because there's a payment issue or something with uh, the leasee, so they refuse to provide us those leases. Uh, we oftentimes have to go and look up property taxes online, the property tax bills, and try to establish who actually is the owner of a property. Uh, we cross-check with the, student data, the state database for free and reduced lunch eligibility to make sure that the numbers and the addresses are valid. It's another piece, another piece of trying to prove where that residency is. Um, if, if we determine intent to move into a district, uh, do we consider them as tuition students? That was a whole new wrinkle, if you remember, with the new policy on tuition students uh, establishing residency after the first of the year. So that has taken some time. Homeless has become a huge issue. Determining the homeless for these residents uh, is a very complicated process. Uh, we are still uh, talking with legal about what the parameters are for homeless, and there seems to be some disagreement about what you can and cannot do with homeless in an investigation. So we're trying to review that to make sure we're on sto solid ground. Uh, we have special residency documentation issues sometimes. Uh, we oftentimes ask people for special residency that if some, someone is living there, um, there's some issues with that sometimes on what they provide. And you know the other thing is that we do uh, provide um, hire investigators and it gets to that point when investigators go out and actually videotape, uh, follow some residents around, try to establish where those residencies are. So, you know, overall, those are some of the complications that, that are part of the, establish this residency. And so, again, uh, I want to come back and make sure we're all comfortable with the policy that we have in place. Legal is working on that right now. Make sure all the board understands that process and that you're comfortable with that process going forward. Uh, we will continue to raise the issues with the investigation. We had a recent hearing just this week. Um, and again, you may see a spike in those hearings and investigations as we move forward. But you know, as soon as that policy comes, I'm hoping to have it at the next board meeting, um, at the next policy committee, so that we can review that and move it on to the Board of Education. So I guess with that, any questions or comments from the board that I should be aware of that as we move forward in this process? Margaret? Yeah. Um, thank you, Dave, for explaining um, the process. And, um, and obviously, residency and establishing residency is very complicated. I think it's also very sensitive. It's complicated, it's sensitive, and it's, it's very important. And I think it's important um, not just because of tax dollars that may or may not be um, tax dollars that aren't um, going to the community. I think it's, more imp it's also important on engagement of the people. And there have been studies that say people who are not in the community have a tendency to be less engaged. And that creates a lot of, of, um, of other challenges. And we just talked about academics and curriculums, and I think that's one way that it may play out. My thought on here is that leases, I think, you know, from my perspective, is very sensitive. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if residency is something that we, we, ha we need to focus on, if that's a key priority that the district, um, that the board feels like we need to move forward on and be more aggressive on it, then my question is, can we do an overarching policy for everyone when they register um, the year that they have to show some type of proof of residency? So whether it's a lease or a utility bill or a mortgage statement or whatever it is, but for every person that registers a child every year, if that's, a, if that's the path we want to go, that they, show, they bring some identification of residency. Um, and that way, I think perceptions are there's no, we're looking at one group of population or the other. We're looking at everyone. If we can open up our ability of what we might accept. So if a lease is, is very difficult to accept, then is a utility bill 
equally um, credible. And I know bills in with people going with E statements are a little harder, but can we open up what we're able to accept? Um, so that's one of my questions. I guess the primary question is the amount of um, of effort, the priority that we're, we place on determining residency, and is it a every year perspective? Is it a every other year? Is it a check based off of someone gives us a tip? You know, how do how do we how do we um, determine? You know, who is selected to um, check for residency? I think, I think just as background, if you remember when we talked about this last spring, uh, we did talk a little bit about whether we were going to do on a yearly basis, as Margaret suggests, an overall check. I don't think you have the manpower resources to do it for the whole district. Uh, I think you may want to entertain in the future looking at a particular grade level. Uh, a lot of districts do that when they make the transition out of elementary to sixth grade, they have everybody checked for residency in, the, in their registration process. The same thing happens going from eighth grade to ninth grade. We would have to look at, you know, what is the manpower issues with that because you would, it would be intense on the front end because as people register, uh, you would have to provide that data. The other thing I will, I will send the board in, it, it's, uh, it's in our, on our website, but I'll send it, is the, the number of pieces of documents documentation we need for residency. So perhaps the board should review that to make sure we're comfortable because it's not just one piece. We require three or four pieces of specific documentation uh, to show that there that you are a resident on the address that you claim. So it's a utility bill plus it's other things that we require, driver's license. So there's some options there, but I think the board should know what those options are and you're comfortable with that. John? I want to thank you for checking with the attorney on the policy. I'm very comfortable with the uh, opinion of the attorney that our policy is uh, adequate on the first point, and I'm looking forward to see, you know, what they provide uh, on the second point. Um, I think it's, as I said in email to you, Dave, I... You know, there's two points. Do the rules lay it out? If the rules do, as the attorney says, that's great. And then we look again. The second issue is fairness. Is it fair? And that's the issue that Margaret's dealing with, is the issue of fairness. And one thing I want to be aware, or want us all to be aware of, um, because we will be, I think, hearing these things as a board, or whatever comes out, um, that there isn't always a lease in place and a lease expires and there's holdover turn tenancies people pay with cash people pay with this the crucial issue is does the kid live there and there's indirect evidence and direct evidence and i just want to make sure that our use of indirect evidence like a lease um and it is indirect because it's the parents arrangement and it may not be documented uh, that it is fair um given the limited resources that some of our families have and that's really just something and i trust based on the history that you've handled these things the sensitivity that you've handled them um and the diligence that it will be fair yeah let me just i pull this up in the internet so just just so you know what we require right now uh when the person comes in the parent registering the student we need a photo id of that person so they establish that. Then we require three re proofs of residency. One of the following, uh, mortgage papers, tax bill, or original signed lease, and, a, or, and or a residency affidavit completed and notarized by the district if applicable. So that's one piece. Second piece, two of the following. We also require utility bill, public aid card, or a letter from the Department of Immigration. Uh, then a copy of the student's birth certificate with the embossed seal. Uh, 
Uh, and then if there's an issue of legal custody, the documents for legal custody through divorce, who is legally uh, divorce decrees, uh, temporary legal guardianship, all of those, we require that. And then if it, it, and then a signed lease of transfer form if the student is transferring from another Illinois public school. So those are the pieces that we require as people go in. And as I said, it does get complicated because of some of the issues that I talked about before. But you know, the board should review those and be comfortable with those if that's you know what we're using as proof of residency, and then to move forward from there. I think I, I'm comfortable with the way the policy reads that it delegates to you what's an appropriate evidence of, of residency. Um, I don't see any evidence for changing that. Okay. Yeah. I think we've all heard, I've certainly heard from the community that the community expects us to be diligent mm -hmm. in providing children who are our residents the best possible education given our resources that we can possibly provide. And to be diligent also about making sure we're educating only the kids that live in this district. And this goes to that point. Um, personally, I, I don't see, uh, the, the work that I've seen this administration do has been extremely fair, to, to reiterate your point, John. Um, and I think it's been extremely reasonable. Um, I think uh, the work I've seen done has gone to a great degree of diligent and, and effort to make sure that we are not attempting to exclude someone who actually does live in our within District 205 boundaries. So I, I, I'm comfortable with the level of diligence that, I, that I've seen from the administration, and I agree with you, John. I think it is fair. Um, but I, I think we need to remain to be diligent. Um, when this comes back, I, I think we should discuss, should we, should we require from everyone at, uh, at what grades should we require the full set of documentation uh, again from, from parents? Um, because I, I think the vast majority of these cases that have come to the board during my time on the board have been from people who legitimately lived here at one point and then moved away but continue to bring their children to our schools pretending that they never moved. Um, and, and frankly, I, I think another class of, uh, of uh, high potential for that type of violation is people that have sold their houses. I don't know how difficult that list is to get of what houses sold each year and, and are those children in our district. But it seems like, just like leases that have a finite expiration date, uh, once you sell your house, uh, I think it's reasonable to ask those people, where did you move to? So I, frankly, I, I you know, don't want to discriminate against people, and I don't believe we are discriminating against people that, that lease, um, but I do believe we need to be diligent um, in in all situations where where someone's residency reasonably could be expected to terminate, we need to make sure that they've reestablished residence within our district. John, go ahead. There's a couple things we do. We write policy and we do oversight. And I'm reluctant to memorialize specific uh, methods. Um, and leave that to the discretion of the uh, superintendent, knowing that we still have oversight and there's no indication so far, from my opinion, that oversight hasn't been sufficient. And so I'd be reluctant to, I'd still want to hear about it, I still want to know what's planned, you know, how it's going, but at the same time I'd be reluctant to, to memorialize it in policy. I'm, yeah, I'm not suggesting that we memorialize specific instructions to the administration and, and policy. What, as I said before, what what we've seen so far, the oversight that we've seen has has been has been good. Just one other comment. So you were a lot of times, and we're seeing an increase in this. And Chris can, um, 
you know, give you examples. Um, we we get all of the necessary documentation that we have, and in some cases, the, it, they are staying with a relative who gives us a special affidavit that they're re residing there. What we're running into, though, is the fact that they're not residing there, that they are not, by definition of Illinois, uh, are not residing, which is where the children sleeping at night. So those in, in, in spite of all of this, we can have that documentation, but we're still doing investigations because of those issues that are kind of outside the policy piece, but we suspect uh, or we get reports that they're not really residing there and we're following up. Those are most recently the ones we are running into now. Now, where uh, a grandmother or another relative or grandfather reside in Elmhurst, claim that the children are staying there, their grandchildren, but as a matter of fact, uh, we don't believe sometimes they are. So that's the other piece that we're running into. Any other comments or questions? All right. Next on our agenda is the superintendent's uh, consent agenda. Uh, on tonight's agenda, there are three donations to approve. And I'll just quickly... Uh, yeah, committee reports first. Oh, I apologize. I have skipped board committee reports. Thank you, Mr. Purnell. Um, to, we've had two committees meet. Let me back up. We've had two committees meet since we last met. The policy committee and the performance management committee. So uh, let's move on to those committee reports. First, the policy committee. Um, our meeting was on September 23rd. Um, we approved minutes from July 15th. We went through a press update and recommended uh, that the board approved the revised policy for policy n number 2 colon 105 Illinois Ethics and Gift Ban Act and policy number 7 colon 340 student records both of those policies were revised to track statutory changes that uh, are relevant in their application and referenced in their uh, language um, as regards policy 2 colon 120 uh, Dave asked us to hold off on that while he got clarification on uh, I guess the interaction with para and uh, board member development and he's going to present I guess a revised uh, policy when that's clarified um, family uh, we reviewed and recommended approval of policy number five colon 185 family and medical leave um, to track the contract language I believe that was the issue on that one uh, we recommended uh, approval of policy uh, four colon 60 purchases and contracts which included that uh, non-customary purchase or expenditure language and authorizing contracts um, after a long discussion of it we determined it gave adequate uh, direction to this to the administration and recommend approval of that um, we had a open discussion about advertising and on that one um, the issue was uh, you know there are a lot of issues it's a we do we found out that uh, we do relatively little advertising um, and that there was some feeling that there might be an opportunity but it needed some investigation um, significant policy questions are involved what could be advertised where can you advertise how do you advertise um, and it was good recommendation and I think the board seemed to have consensus that it was an excellent topic for the uh, community forum coming up in the first week of November um, having watched our long discussion I wasn't sure where we left off as far as breakout sessions or not breakout sessions but I think it was one of the favored breakout topic items so I guess I just like clarification are we going to do a breakout I'm sorry Emily I'm asking I'm asking Karen and then Emily I'm sorry um, but if we do breakouts it was believed that that would be a good topic for one of the breakouts so right so our plan is to do the um, slideshow presentation everyone be in this room slideshow presentation but then we kind of it's not a formal breakout session we're all going to stay in this room but you know like 
a school board member to will walk to the back of the room, this side of the room, that side of the room, just to kind of talk to people, feedback about, in a small group, feedback about the slideshow, and then also, you know, if the conversation leads there, bring up advertising, and then our other topic was um, the fate of the hospital's Berto campus and how, you know, whatever happens to that land could impact the district. Mm -hmm. So it's not really a breakout session because we're all staying in this room. Okay. All right. But we talked about um, grouping the chairs in clusters, maybe around a desk, just to kind of have a, um, kind of like we did, we did this at the LEND meeting, and so maybe that's why we had been talking about that, where... There's a separation, but not technically a breakout. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> technology. Um, we discussed technology and uh, recognizing the generosity of our PTAs and our other school community uh, efforts in uh, providing resources for our district. Um, there seemed to be uh, two or three issues that, that needed to be discussed. And uh, one is, uh, I think, uh, a sense that some of these items may be uh, driving technology in our district in a way uh, that we need to to bring some focus back so that these uh, technology developments track what the research is determined is the best educational practices um, doesn't provide issues of support or implementation or maintenance um, and for me, most importantly, also provides equity between our schools. Um, these are, I think, important policy issues. Um, and the discussion, uh, it was a good discussion. And I know it continued, it's continued in other forums, including last board meeting. Um, there seemed to be a general consensus that we would discuss it with those groups that are so generous and are working so hard and and see if we can, as a joint effort, address those issues, uh, particularly the equity issue. I don't know if I summarized last meeting's discussion adequately, uh, but I think there was to be a three-way discussion with PTA, Council, um, Foundation, and a couple of board members. Wasn't that the, the plan? That, that's correct. Yeah. OK. And uh, I think everybody in the committee thought that was an excellent suggestion. Um, and I think, did we have further discussion after that? Um, and then we adjourned at 845. A little long for us, but. <laughs> Sounds like you covered a lot. Yeah. Any, go ahead, Karen. Do we have an update on um, the revenue potential from advertising. I know that last time we were on policy that, you know, we knew it was going to be maybe a couple ten thousand dollars, but not a lot of money. And I just wondered if we ever did get the numbers. No, we had not given the numbers because the boosters were the group that wanted to come forward and do a pilot. Uh, I didn't feel comfortable giving the okay th with the discussion that was still going on about advertising, period, because what you would have to do is kind of let the boosters go and see how much uh, funding would be generated, how much interest there would be out there. So that has not gone forward. It can certainly go forward as part of the board letting them know, but I have not l let them go on that one yet. Yeah, I, I would think we would need at least the framework of a policy in place uh, before we send someone out soliciting um, for advertisements. Yeah. Well, well not, not soliciting, right. but just knowing what the exactly potential exactly. Just the baseline yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Emily. Maybe this is what John was going to say, but the policy right now does allow it, right, with superintendent's approval. We looked at that. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have to change the policy to allow advertising. Uh, only if you wanted to tighten up the guidelines. Yes. But but again, I would want direction from the board right, right. as to what uh, the board is comfortable the superintendent giving approval for. And, and this gets into a legal, dot, you know, a legally a limited form um, from a public body. And so there's some legal ramifications. And frankly, as a board, I would think we want to hear from the community mm -hmm. uh, before we were to embark on that. Mm -hmm. 
Anything else? It, so just a, it's kind of a chicken or egg discussion. Um, do you look at the magnitude of the potential and get involved not knowing what the policy is? So you, you find out the magnitude and then discuss your policy, or do you discuss your policy and then look for the magnitude? If you're asking my personal opinion, I think I'd like to have a policy in place uh, about you know where and what we would expect to be advertised, uh, or, or more appropriately, where and what not we would expect to be advertised, um, and then figure out, given those constraints, what is the potential for revenue. And, and then the other issue is going to be who gets the funding if they go out and do the solicitation and all of that. Does it go to the district? Does it go to booster groups? Does it go to special interest clubs? That's a whole other issue because um, they would probably claim, we did all the work, we've knocked on doors to get the advertising going on, why do we not benefit from that? So that's another issue the board might have to deal with. John, go ahead. I, I guess I would view it as if there is advertising revenue, it's going to be a combination of both the effort and the district's resources, whether it's the facilities and the uh, events that bring uh, traffic to the advertising message. Yeah. I, I think on every superintendent's bookshelf, there are several cans of worms, and I would believe this is one of them. Yeah, you know, the other thing I do know, though, if, if there's a vision of generating hundreds of thousands of dollars in advertising, just so we put this in perspective, I have never seen that. That's not to say thousands of dollars could not be earned, but it's not going to bail out any big program or anything. You just don't, at the, at the school district level, public schools, uh, they just do, do not generate. This is not like universities who come in partnership with Nike and, you know, there's big promotions and, and those corporations are willing to spend significant dollars on college athletics, college promotion. That has not been the case for public education. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. I, I think there's a lot of unanswered questions on here, but I don't think that we can hypothesize as a board and get all of the answers. I think I agree with um, Jim in that we need to get some community input. And the only way to try to answer some of these, these questions is to, in some way, if it's a significant enough issue, if the community tells us it's a significant enough issue, put one pilot in place, recognize it as a pilot, and see how that pilot works or doesn't work. Once that pilot's in place, we've got some parameters. It would be the, re it would be the responsibility for whoever crafts the pilot to put some of the parameters on there so we'll know exactly what is being done, when it's being done, how it's being done. They would, the responsibility of the group to put that in place. Mm. We could review that, decide if that's appropriate, if it's not appropriate, suggest changes. And then once we've got an appropriate proposal, then we could see, does it generate funds? What are the potential ramifications? You know, is it worth the effort? Uh, and then we could update our policy as regarded. But I don't know that we will come to answer all these questions until we um, try something. If the community decides that this is not something worth trying, then that's our answer. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to get that input from the community, and if the community says there's something mm -hmm. we're worth um, looking at, then we need to try something. So to your point, Murray, let's, let's ask the community what they think. Mm -hmm. Let's put some parameters around it. Uh, and I would expect this is a policy that before we have an enduring policy, will be revised many times as as we live and learn. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I agree. Let's let's get a trial out there, but let's let's put some parameters around it first. I just have one question. Go ahead. Just one question of clarification. I know that there's uh, groups that are willing to help out, um, but Dave, just you know, to help us clarify and communicate. Um, it will require manpower from the district to work with those groups and manage this whole thing, yes? 
Yeah, more than likely it will. I mean, you, depending on the guidelines and what those guidelines say, I mean, there's a, n a number of levels you'll, you're going to have to decide, for example, where, the big question, where, uh, where do you allow advertising? Uh, what access do you allow the advertisers into the district um, with that? Um, secondly, then, uh, who do you allow in uh, and who do you not allow in? And then the other question of how that money is generated and where does that money get earmarked for? So those are all kind of things you're going to have to deal with. When you say who, you mean like what kind of products? That's, right. yeah. Right. What is the community comfortable with putting in front right. of the community and students? Yeah. Um, and and, and w how wide is that range? And I, it varies by community. And I think it's a sliding scale. You know, the more you let in and the more you relax on that, the, the more money that you make. And just we got to find yeah. that balance that the community's comfortable Yeah, with. I have seen yeah. all the way from the typical advertising at the stadium all the way to advertising in the high school on a wall um, to uh, TV set up with advertising at the high school again that, that are in the hallway that students sit and watch uh, TV commercials and and there's money generated by the district for that I mean it the, some of these are very aggressive in how they do that but that's that's the range you're gonna start getting into okay we done with policy Shall we move on to performance management okay I'm gonna provide a, a high-level update um, we met on September 26th and we talked about the superintendent goals and evaluation from two perspectives one uh, backwards looking and then one forward looking from a backwards perspective um, I just wanted to update the board that our recommendation um, is and I know you heard about this and agreed to it at the last meeting of having two closed sessions um, and but the the nuance here is the committee um, when we met on September 26 we talked about moving our first meeting up to earlier in May and then um, uh, in June and ending by July 1st so you know if anybody has uh, any um, other ideas let us know otherwise you'll get an email from me and I'll take consensus of the board that that's a good structure based on how busy the schedule is is why we we really kind of looked at how we're gonna how are we gonna meet this deadline and you know when can we um, when can we fit those meetings in? And if we all agree to that, I'm gonna be working with Ellen to get them on the calendar now instead of waiting when we get closer to it. And I think that that will make sure that we manage the process and meet our dates, okay? So as we looked forward, um, we were really try tying into, and you know, this is not new news, but just so that you know, um, tying in goals and objectives you know, for the upcoming year. How are you planning to, you know, um, work and how that all works with all of the improvement plans like we heard in the DPI conversation. So that is something, um, the, the reason why Dave had sent in some of the weekly updates, the principal goals and um, objectives for the year. So that was a great, um, great communication piece. So thank you, Dave. And then as we moved into the DPIs, which is another theme um, for performance management, you kind of heard uh, the theme around it uh, and, and what the objective was during our student achievement discussion. And so what we're really looking at is, you know, what's the bigger picture process plan of all of these, all of these individual efforts that really link together and just, you know, working on how do we how do we do that, communicate it, understand it, et cetera? And I think it's gonna alleviate a lot of the questions we have. Lastly, we looked at our Performance Management Committee annual plan. Um, and we, you'll be getting an update from um, you know, what, what we're gonna be covering because we're gonna look at our three themes and then we're um, plugging in specific dates during the year to meet to um, address them. I think that was it. Any questions? Okay. Then let's move on to where I tried to skip to. That would be the superintendent's consent agenda. There are three items on it uh, tonight. Um, and I'll quickly review all three. Uh, they're all donations to various elementary schools. The first is to Jackson School. 
We have an enterprising special ed teacher who um, put a project on a national website called DonorsChoose.org, which is a fascinating website where it, which allows individuals to contribute money to causes they deem worthy by reading uh, proposals from various people, including our own special ed teacher at Jackson. Um, this teacher has uh, accumulated about $1,500 in donations from individuals to uh, fund iPads, cases, and iTunes credits uh, for software. Um, like I said, a value of about $1,500. The second is the approval of donation to uh, Emerson School. The Emerson PTA has generously donated seven, approximately $7,000 to fund uh, 13 wireless access points. And uh, finally, the Dad's Club at Lincoln has uh, contributed about $2,800 to buy basketball hoops uh, that will be available for, including their installation, which will be available for all uh, K through five students at Lincoln School. So to each of those uh, three groups, I wanna say thank you. And um, let me ask for a, um, a motion for the superintendent's consent agenda, please. John. I move that we approve the superintendent's agenda, consent agenda, items A, B, and C. I second the motion. Okay. Moved by John, John McDonough, seconded by Karen Stufen. Um, and uh, Mrs. Walsh, will you please call the roll? Mr. McDonough? Yes. Mrs. Stufen? Yes. Dr. Harrell? Yes. Mrs. Bistito? Yes. Mrs. Ebner? Yes. Mr. Bloom is absent. Mr. Collins? Yes. So we have six ayes, no nays, one absent. That motion carries. Uh, and then the next agenda, uh, the next item on our agenda is the superintendent's agenda action items, which is the approval of a resolution affirming the philosophy, priorities, and guidelines for the use of York High School's Clarence D. East Field and uh, Stadium Facility. Um, Mr. Pernod, you want to give a little background to this? Yeah, if you remember right, uh, we have been working with the York Community Advisory Council uh, on this subject of the stadium use and our philosophy priorities and guidelines for its use, especially around this group, which is the neighborhood group uh, that is adjacent to the stadium and York High School. And so we have been working on this for about a year. We were trying to divide, develop a policy. The concern from the York Community Advisory Council was they wanted to somehow memorialize this agreement uh, because board members will change the administration will change they they felt this was a good um, working collaborative effort uh, and they didn't want it to be left on the wayside in in five or ten years uh, and it has worked very well so the challenge was is it a policy how do we memorialize it uh, and it was finally determined that while it did not lend itself to a policy it probably did lend itself to a resolution and so we developed a resolution uh, we met with the York Community Advisory Council again reviewed the resolution with them I reviewed it with them at two separate meetings uh, and what you see in front of you uh, has been approved by their council and now is before the board as a resolution to be adopted here this evening and again related to the use of York High School's uh, Clarence East Field and the stadium facility can I get a motion on this, please? Shana? I move that the Board of Education approve the resolution affirming philosophy, priorities, and guidelines for the use of York High School's Clarence D. East Field and Stadium Facility. Karen? I second the motion. Okay. Moved by Mrs. Ebner, seconded by Mrs. Stufen. Um, this does not require a roll call vote. It's a resolution, it will. Oh, it will. Okay, I'm sorry. Mrs. Walsh, then. Mrs. Ebner? Yes. Mrs. Stufen? Yes. Dr. Harrell? Yes. Mr. Bloom is absent. Mr. McDonough? Yes. Mrs. Bestito? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. Six ayes, no nays, one absent that the resolution carries. Uh, next on our agenda is upcoming meetings. Uh, and all of these will occur in the rooms that we're in presently. Tuesday, October 15th, the Finance and Operations Committee meets at 6.30 p.m. Tuesday, October 22nd, is our regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting, which will begin at 7.30 in this, 
in these rooms. Monday, November 4th, the Board Improvement Committee meeting. Oh, I'm sorry, which we've recently rescheduled to October 29th. I'm sorry. So October 29th is the Board Improvement Committee meeting. And then uh, Tuesday, November 5th, is the uh, Joint Board of Education and uh, PTA Community Forum, uh, again, to be held here at 7 p.m. Uh, and then finally, Wednesday, November 6th, the Curriculum and Instruction Committee meeting at 7 p.m. in these rooms. Um, next on the agenda is board communications. Anything uh, to be shared? Hearing nothing, that brings us to the uh, end of our uh, agenda on our meeting. And I declare this meeting adjourned.